Doppeltalk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the third edition of the CSCS Beat, More Than Just Matters of the Heart. My name is Ansar Hassan. I'm a cardiac surgeon here at the New Brunswick Heart Center in St. John, New Brunswick, which is in Canada. And I'm also president-elect of the CSCS. What is the CSCS, you might be asking? Well, the CSCS is the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons, and we represent cardiac surgeons as well as cardiac surgical trainees from across Canada. This past year, we began a podcast series to discuss cardiac topics of interest for our membership and beyond. And for our third podcast, we're going to switch gears entirely. Mm -hmm. That's right. The CSCS is excited to be co-hosting this podcast with Top Med Talk, a leading medical podcast. And together, we're going to discuss ERAS. That's right, ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, specifically cardiac surgery. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my co-host for today's event, Desiree Chapel. Desiree is a certified registered nurse anesthetist and vice president of clinical quality for North Star Anesthesia. She has coordinated and assisted in the implementation of successful enhanced recovery programs, and she is also the lead anchor of Top Med Talk. Welcome, Desiree. Thank you so much, Answer. This is a, just a total change because usually I'm uh, running the podcast. So I'm so excited to be here co-hosting with you and um, all of your colleagues to work with the colleagues from the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgery. It's awesome. What a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, thank you. This is going to be a lot of fun. It is, absolutely. And ERAS, um, I always say we can talk for days <laughs> about enhanced recovery. So we'll, uh, it's going to be actually a challenge to keep everything short. <laughs> well, that's for sure. But you know what's interesting about ERAS is that as a cardiac surgeon, I feel like I'm hearing more and more about ERAS than ever before. Initially, I just tried to ignore it because I figured maybe it was just a passing fad, but it's not. It's here to stay. What's changed? Yeah, no, it's uh, pretty sticky these days, especially here in North America. Um, I feel like we've been a little bit behind the curve. It's been around for a while, and we're going to hear about that in just a bit. But, um, you know, ERAS has forced us to, to change the way we think about the patient journey, right? So we've always been kind of focused in on our phase of care. But um, and, and when it comes to patient outcomes, uh, it's no longer like one independent effect of clinical risk factors. It's a complex interplay of clinical processes across the entire spectrum, the continuum of perioperative care. And that's what really drives those outcomes. And, you know, we can do a lot to affect those care processes positively and improve quality. It's really a truly multidisciplinary and multifaceted approach. I agree totally. And that's what I've started to appreciate. It's interesting though. I'm sure there is a lot of people like me, surgeons who have always kind of thought, well, what's the need for ERAS when we've been doing kind of continuous quality improvement initiatives like the Northern New England Cardiovascular Disease Study Group, or even databases like the SDS that have really just, you know, made, made a, a real name for themselves, examining outcomes and identifying predictors of poor outcomes. Uh, but obviously there is more to it than just that. And I think, as you said, we need to not limit ourselves to just factors that we have traditionally measured. Anyway, look, let's not waste any more time. We've got amazing guest speakers. We have got three of them and let's start by introducing them. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I am going to introduce Professor Monty Mythen, who is Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at the University College London and co-president of the International Board of Perioperative Medicine. Now, Monty, I've introduced you plenty of times before. Um, he also happens to be the editor-in-chief of Top Med Talk and my co-host, uh, Monty Mythen. Hello, Monty. How are you? Hi, Desiree. It's great to be here. Hi, Ansar. It's lovely to meet you. Well done for, for, uh, for your podcast. Yeah, super exciting. Well, Monty, um, one of the things that we talk a lot on Top Med Talk, but a lot of the listeners here may not know, um, you have been involved with Enhanced Recovery for a very long time. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I started my journey with the perioperative medicine movement in the UK starting about 20 years ago. And as part of that journey, I was lucky enough to be appointed by our government as a national clinical lead for the rapid spread and adoption of enhanced recovery, along with a surgical colleague, Alan Horgan, in 2008, uh, seemed to go remarkably well, such that by 2012, they signed it off as being standard practice. So the medical students only, they don't know what enhanced recovery is. They, everyone now does that, the whole enhanced recovery thing, you know, nas no nasogastric tubes, eating immediately postoperatively, even for a segmental bowel resection. And everyone just thinks it's normal now. No. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I think this is going to be great. We've got our next guest is a, a dear friend of mine, a colleague that I've known for many, many years. We were residents together in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Dalhousie University, Dr. Rakesh Aurora. Dr. Rakesh Aurora is a, a chief of cardiac surgery and a critical care specialist at St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He's uh, one of the, really the true pioneers of cardiac critical care, especially in Canada, and co-founded the Canadian Cardiovascular Critical Care Society. And last but not least, last but not least, he's the current president of the Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons. Rakesh, hey, I know a lot about you, but maybe tell others what interested you specifically about ERAS and how you got involved. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Anser, and it's great being part of the podcast yet again and uh, be on the panel with Monty, and we'll hear about Dan Engelman shortly. It's uh, going to be a great fun to go through this sort of roundtable discussion. So my entry into ERAS, I'll be honest, started without really knowing what ERAS was a decade ago. My, my primary goal as a critical care physician was trying to understand postoperative delirium. And after really a spectacularly impress, impressive failure on my first grant with delirium, I called a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Rudolph, who is a geriatrician at Brown University, he said, well, why don't you look at frailty and how that interacts with delirium? I knew nothing about frailty, so I learned everything I could to learn about frailty. And that really kind of got me into this idea of prehabilitation or trying to find ways to optimize the surgical journey for the older adult as an earliest time point as possible. And as we've been doing that over the last number of years, I then met Dan Engelman and other like-minded people that got me interested in enhanced recovery. So we were kind of doing it without really knowing what ERAS was, and it's worked out uh, well for our patients in being part of this group uh, going forward. Well, that's great, Rakesh. Thank you so much. Well, let's go ahead and introduce our next guest, Dan Engelman. <laughs> We've talked about him quite a bit. So Dan is the medical director of the Heart, Vascular, and Critical Care Units at Bay State Medical Center in the U.S., um, Dan, it's so wonderful to see you again. We've worked a lot on Top Med Talk discussing enhanced recovery after surgery for cardiac. Tell us a little bit more about um, that and your involvement with the ERAS Cardiac Group. Uh, thank you. And uh, Ansar and Rakesh, thank you for inviting me to uh, join uh, Monty and uh, Desiree on this uh, very uh, enlightening uh, podcast. So uh, it's kind of a strange journey. It was in uh, 2017, we kept reading about ERAS. And like Ansar, I had no idea what it was. And I said, well, we have a, a perfect database. We have the SDS database is the largest quality database. We track everything. I don't understand how this could possibly affect us in cardiac surgery. How can we benefit from it? And then I actually read the guidelines and for the other specialties. And they were talking about things we never even considered like uh, um, let's try opioid use and the use of multimodal analgesia instead of opioids. I mean, we knew not to use a lot of benzodiazepines, but we weren't tracking opioids and we certainly were not using a lot of multimodals. And I started reading more about their mobilization and their nutrition and their NPO at midnight they got rid of. And I said, well, let's look at the cardiac guidelines because they're at every subspecialty. And it turns out they told me there are none. There was some in thoracic at the time that had just come out, but no cardiac. So I got a group of um, anesthesiologists, uh, critical care intensivists, and uh, cardiac surgeons together who were sort of like-minded thinking, well, let's see if we could standardize some of these things. Let's see what's out there in the literature, write some guidelines, which we did. And we published in 2019. And we were a little concerned at the time that maybe cardiac surgeons weren't ready for this, that they were kind of, you know, we were putting them off and that they would not particularly take kindly to being told what's best practice. But I think they sort of get it now because they keep inviting us back to speak at all of their national meetings. Mm -hmm. And the, the key part that we realize as surgeons, at least this is my opinion, is that we spend so much time at our national international meetings discussing operative techniques, valve choices, graft choices, arterial conduits versus non-arterial, but we spend so little time discussing optimization of our patients preoperatively and standardizing evidence-based best practice postoperatively. And it turns out there's a lot of room there to improve. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it behooves us as cardiac surgeons to really, you know, look at every opportunity we can to improve the outcomes in our patients, not only in the short term, but over the long term as well. Look, uh, let's let's move this along. Rakesh, I'm going to pass the mic over to you to speak um, and ask you really just to set the scene uh, for this roundtable discussion. Right. So thanks very much, Answer. So what I'll do is just go through a very brief little overview of ERAS 
to provide a framework for the roundtable discussion we'll have in just a couple moments here. Um, so really, what is ERAS and what does it mean anyways to our, our cardiac surgeon colleagues who may be less familiar with this concept? And this comes back to a fundamental principle of the older adult. And this is a term or a, a model, a paradigm that Jim Rudolph and I came up with a few years ago called the three strike model. And what we're referring to are the three different potential vulnerabilities around a patient that can lead to poor post-operative outcomes. Specifically, there is some baseline vulnerability of our patients, and some of that we may recognize by the eyeball tests. We go, well, they look kind of older and look kind of thin and frail, uh, but there are also other components that fill up that particular vulnerability, such as cognitive dysfunction, which don't necessarily measure routinely, nutrition or malnutrition specifically, psychosocial stressors, and others that all combine to give you this overall vulnerable state or frailty, which is really a lack of reserve for major stressors such as cardiac surgery. They next undergo this stress called cardiac surgery itself and undergo the cardiopulmonary bypass for a majority of our cases. They have the anesthetic, there's blood loss and transfusions interoperatively. Then they come to us in a post-operative phase and the various hemodynamic perturbations, lack of mobility, delay in nutrition starting, the environment that leads to sleep deprivation, the use of opioids and others all contribute to issues that can lead to post-operative outcomes or three different strikes through that entire patient journey. And while we have as a society or as a specialty in cardiac surgery focused very heavily and very comprehensively on the mortality aspect of cardiac surgery, it's really the morbidity and long-term impacts perhaps we've not done as comprehensive of a job of looking at. So when you look at outcomes for patients, I am confident patients and their families absolutely care if they don't make it through the procedure. But I think also they really do care about whether they can go home and have a good functional quality of life where they can maintain their own activities of daily living, remember who their grandkids are, and other things that are important for long-term quality survival. So we came up with this term a few years ago, and to be honest, we kind of just made it up, but we published it several times called poor functional survival. And what that means is someone who's alive and in their own home versus someone who's alive and somewhere other than their own home, such as a skilled nursing facility or a long-term care facility where they have lost functional independence. We thought that was a negative patient-centered outcome in addition to mortality. So when we thought about why this occurs, we have been leaving the same processes that we've all alluded to of how we evaluate patients preoperatively, how we conduct their operation, and how we've taken care of them postoperatively the same way for a number of decades. And we've gotten away with that because by and large, our patients were a little bit younger, they had less comorbid status, and they could tolerate a certain degree of the various three strikes that we talked about at the top of this. Unfortunately, our patients have gotten older and sicker. And while we've been lamenting that for the last two decades, perhaps, it's actually in our back, backyard now with the average age uh, of, of patients coming through for cardiac surgery being above the age of 65 in most cardiac surgery centers. So patients are getting older and sicker. And the way that we've treated these patients requires a more comprehensive plan to address their various vulnerabilities. So how do you go about doing that? Well, I think focusing, as Dan mentioned, just in the interoperative phase is critical. You need the right operation done meticulously sleep with a good anesthetic to get people through that particular phase. However, our preoperative evaluation, optimization, both in the preoperative, postoperative, and upon hospital discharge back to the community are important transition points where vulnerabilities of patients can come to light and lead to negative outcomes for a patient. So really addressing the entire patient journey is really the, the overall mantra, if you will, of enhanced recovery after, after surgery. So how do we do that for cardiac surgery? Well, we're relatively young in this area of focus relative to other surgical specialties who've been doing this, again, for about two decades. Dan started this, we'll say, in 2017 with a group of us. I kind of joined the group in 2018, and we went through a series of, of uh, potential vulnerability touch points through the entire patient journey and came up with this 22-step point plan that developed uh, into our guideline statement that was in JAMA surgery published in 2019. And this can be divided into the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative components of how we take care of business for the cardiac surgery patient. Now, in my case, as I mentioned, there were some things we were doing quite well. And when you look at this overall list, it seems overwhelming. And there's, again, things with regards to preoperative nutrition, how we take care of them postoperatively for postop nausea and vomiting, mobilization, 
bowel regime and so forth. Um, we were doing delirium and frailty screening very well, but there were opportunities for us to expand what we do, what we were doing in URAS already without knowing it to other areas. And that's a lot of way where teams can get started. And we'll dive into this a bit more into the actual uh, round table to follow. So with that there, I'll stop and I'll hand it back to you guys to take us through uh, the moderated discussion to follow. All right, great. Right, Rakesh, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for walking us through that. I think that laid out exactly, you know, what enhanced recovery means, what it means to the cardiac world. Um, Monty, I want to start with you and first get a perspective of what is, you know, what does enhanced recovery after surgery look like in the UK now? And then specifically around cardiac, because, you know, we've talked a, a lot about that and kind of where it started when you guys did it back in 2008 to where it is now. So, so when we looked in, in 2008, it was a data-driven process, and we started by looking at variation in outcomes in the, the major surgeries in the country. And we eliminated cardiac as a priority area fairly early on because we have relatively few cardiac centers in the UK. They all kind of trained each other, and the variation at that time was not there and obvious. Now, as we concentrated on everything else – it seems that what's happened recently is when people have turned around and looked at their cardiac practice that somehow variation has developed. So now there's high interest in cardiac, I think, around the world, very much driven by the people on this call, to say actually there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, as, as Henrik Kellett said when he reviewed our program in the UK, well done, a very strong start is what he said. You've made it to the start line. There's a big race ahead. Right, right. Hmm. And, and you know what's what's interesting is, uh, and Dan, I'll, maybe I'll ask you about this. Is you know, let, let's go back a little bit to the point I made earlier, and you also made this point about you know the existing quality improvement initiatives that are already out there. Just kind of flesh it out a little bit. How is it that ERAS is that different? I mean, I, I, Rakesh kind of highlighted some of the things in, that that really define ERAS in his in his in his talk, but from your standpoint, how do you convince the average surgeon who's been so married to the STS database and, and similar type initiatives to say, all right, you know what, you need to kind of get out of that mold and, and start thinking a little bit differently outside the box? Sure. I like telling them about two key metrics that are not part of the STS database that absolutely uh, portend a poor prognosis. Um, the first one is acute kidney injury, which occurs in over 30% of our patients, if you uh, define it as stage one, two, or three acute kidney injury, because any acute kidney injury following cardiac surgery, even if the creatinine returns to baseline prior to discharge, is associated with poor short and long-term survival. That metric is not followed by the STS. All they follow is stage three Cadigo tripling of your creatinine. And there's so many patients that have an elevated creatinine during the post-operative timeframe that's not a full triple. So that is one area that they're completely missing. And I believe a significant portion of this acute kidney injury is preventable with more goal-directed hemodynamic therapy. That's the first one I tell them that they can, that's not part of the SDS, that could be part of a local performance improvement project. And the second one is opioid utilization. Also not measured in the SDS database, absolutely uh, causing major problems because following cardiac surgery, 10 to 15% of our patients are still taking opioids long-term. These are naive patients. They've never seen opioids pre-op. They have their heart surgery. Long-term, three to six months later, 10 to 15% still taking opioids. Why is that? It's directly related to the amount of opioids they get upon discharge. And how do you reduce their opioid prescription on discharge? You reduce it all the way back to the intraoperative component. Less opioids in the OR, less post-op, less on discharge. Uh, Dan, or um, excuse me, Rakesh, I wanted to talk to you. Dan, those are great metrics, but Rakesh, from the point of view of the paper that you guys did and and of your experiences, what are the other metrics that you guys in cardiac are specifically looking at when you have successful patient outcomes? Right. So I think that's a great question, and it comes down to how we measure it. And I think, as as others have pointed out, the STS has major complications as part of their metrics in their three-star rating. I think those are still important metrics, and we shouldn't deviate, deviate away from those. But I think, in addition, it's those short-term and long-term morbidity aspects, which I think are important metrics to look at as well. So in addition to patient-centered outcomes, which are things such as health-related quality of life, long-term disability, et cetera, which are critical, but also looking at location of hospital 
disposition? Where do they go following hospital discharge? Is it going to be at their own home or somewhere else? That's probably an important metric. Uh, hospital recidivism. So how often are they coming back to hospital because of unrecognized issues at time of discharge or unoptimized issues at time of discharge are also problematic. I think those are other particular metrics for success, which are probably important for the program that you may be able to sell your miniature readers on, in addition to those other important patient-centered outcomes as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, I, you know, when I look at this, I say to myself, all right, so we've convinced ourselves, let's just say we've convinced ourselves that ERAS is the way to go, that we need to kind of graduate from the previous version of what we thought was ideal quality improvement. And now we're going into the next phase of improving outcomes at a level that we probably just never really thought of before. How do you implement these programs? And I think I will move over to the professor at this point. Sir, what do you think? Uh, what, what is the best way to, to implement these programs? I mean, you've had a lot of experience over the years, whether it be in the UK and otherwise. How do you convince people that this is the right thing to do? Uh, education, then data, sharing the data. You, you know, you, you've, you've, and you lot data, 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 you set up such that people can't deny where they are in comparison to ever others. And as part of the data, calculate the value proposition. So, you know, what will be the return on this investment? Then you've got to deal with the culture because, it, as we know, culture eats everything for breakfast. So you've got to get everyone on board. You know, if you don't have the whole team agreeing, we'll give this a go. And as part of that, you've got to get over the, um, often with the surgeon, the potential feeling of loss of autonomy, you know, my order set. Uh, and then the next key thing is you've got to give some people some time to make change because you know we're all maxed out and you can't make change without resource and that main resource is expertise matched with time so that would be the main thing i'd say that's what you go and ask your c suites for c suite for is can can we have the um, resource to make the change because now we've won the culture battle we've done the education we know our data and they've got to give you that and 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 as part of that the roi discussion is it is a return on investment it's not just a return, if you said to me. So show me the I and I'll give you the R. Yeah, absolutely. Rakesh, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, so I think that point about investment is, is so important. And it's both a mixture of financial investment and developing the right teams and so forth, but also some degree of sweat equity that goes into these sort of initiatives as well. You really need a champion or champions to, to drive these processes in your hospital or your local clinical context. One way that we found to, to move around this a little bit, I think we recognized this was important. And again, there are multiple points within that guideline statement that you can address. We chose to go on what we did well already, build upon the successes and expand. The other tack we took is we just asked patients. So we gave them a list of 22 um, of the 22 steps. We had them sit around a table in an engagement panel and we had them vote in a Delphi-like process. What is the most important for you? And with that, they gave me and, and our team, the Arbentarians saying, okay, we're gonna focus on these three things next based on what patients say are most important to them. So that was another way we found to circumnavigate this process of how do you do everything, which is impossible for most of us mere mortals, but starting with what would works and then driving what was patient-centric first based on their particular value. Yeah. No, I think those are all very fair points. And and one, just for my own experience to throw in there, because and I, I've worked with a lot of cardiac surgeons too, is mm -hmm. that there are people's my, there are people whose mind you will not change and you can only lead by doing and lead by leading. And so um, don't try and go after and, and, and tap, you know, someone who is the laggard and will never change their mind as your champion, you know, let them see that things work and then, you know, eventually they'll come on board or if they don't, then they have other consequences that, of right, their actions. So um, just my two cents in there. Um, well, right. guys, I want to go through very quickly. So this is a rapid fire round right here. Um, biggest barriers and challenges to an ERAS cardiac program or just enhanced recovery in general. Dan, you go. A variation. Every cardiac surgeon uh, does things the way they were trained at their own institution. They've been doing it for 10, 20 years, and it's really hard for them to change how they do things. So uh, I think that you need a uh, clinical coordinator to lead it, and data is what's king. Data. If they sit in a room and see that one guy's 
all green and he's all red. He doesn't even know what that means. He just knows he wants to be green and it will change him. He will move his behavior. That's great. <laughs> Definitely. Right, Cash, how about you? Yeah, so I think in addition to variation is when you have something that's common after cardiac surgery, it's accepted as being okay or normative or part of what just happens. For example, delirium, AKI, pain, nausea. We say, well, that just part happens when you have surgery. That's not okay. And I think when you have things that happen 20, 30% of the time, that's hard to get people to change their viewpoints around saying, well, how do we actually impact change on those really highly prevalent post-operative issues? And yet they're the easiest to change because you Often, only yeah, tiny absolutely. little change and you can be very, so if you take 30 to 20%, it's, it's a huge win. It's, it's a huge, huge win. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's great. Uh, Monty, from your perspective, real quick, uh, biggest the, challenge. The culture and fear of the unknown. You know, if you take the nasogastric tube out, it, the, the, they'll be harm. If you let them drink, they'll aspirate. You know, there's things that people were brought up on. They're hard to change. And you know the NPO thing. Everyone knows that. People in people at bus stops know that. You know, <laughs> so it's hard to change. So true. All right. Well, then let me let me take the example of uh, thirty day readmission rates in the U.S. And when they talked about taking away remuneration in people who experience an adverse outcome at thirty days and use that as a form of incentivization. Uh, uh, once again, another rapid fire round. How can we best incentivize good behavior? Because just simply relying on people's goodwill doesn't always work, especially in the cardiac surgery world. All right, we're going to go around the table again. Dan, you. Yeah, so uh, I screen every patient to make sure they're not going to be an early readmission. And a patient who has this history of CHF, difficult to diurese, uh, has a very poor home social cir circumstance, so they're probably not going to take their meds. I make sure they go home with a daily weight, a scale, and a nurse that's going to call them from the hospital to make sure they're taking their meds and they're not gaining weight. And that's how I've kept my readmission rate low. So my answer is you need to be proactive and you need data because if one guy's got a 20% readmission rate and the other guy has five, someone's doing something right and someone's not. Yeah. Rakesh. Yeah, so I mean, I think from our Canadian Institute of Health Informatics, or CAHI, which you've been part of and started developing this for cardiac surgery and cardiac across Canada, we can see what our hospital readmission rates are relative to all our other centers in Canada, and you know how you're performing. We may not know why we're performing differently, but we can see demonstrably the how we, we may have different readmission rates at falling isolated cabbage or AVR versus other centers. So again, being very Canadian, we know who everyone is and we can reach out to those centers and ask them, what are you doing differently than we are? So I think that aspect is really key that we have publicly reported data. We don't have granular information for why those readmission rates occur. That would be also very helpful going forward, but having that ability to, to communicate with high versus low performing centers to find out where you can improve upon is really, really uh, a great opportunity for us in Canada. Monty? I think empower patients and don't be scared to use the popular press once enough people are on board because hmm. you know people people want people want it they what they want they want enhanced recovery well and i think What's the alternative you know absolutely and i think you bring up a great point about empowering the patient and i mean there are mechanisms now that are in place or that are being introduced uh, where the patients are given an app and they're asked to kind of continually communicate with their care providers. And, you know, oftentimes we have very sort of monochromatically looked at their outcomes in terms of who's had AFib and who's been fluid overloaded, but we don't really get down to maybe the, the granular level of, you know what, yeah, you may not have had atrial fib or you may not have had a pleural effusion, but do you feel good or, you know, are you happy? And if they're not, then we still may not have succeeded at the end of the day. And I think that's what we kind of need to look at. And there are, there are programs and companies out there that are lo looking to do just that, but that's clearly an area of interest. Desiree. Yeah, for sure. No, you know, I had one, uh, one more question. We're going to be wrapping it up here shortly, but um, specifically about um, opioids. Dan had mentioned this before, and I know, uh, you know, this kind of ties into how do you start a cardiac in an ERAS program or an ERAS cardiac program? I think this is probably similar. Opioids seem to be kind of that low hanging fruit for us. If we can reduce opioids, um, you know, that's a win, win, win for everyone, but that's also how a lot of people get into this ERAS world. Dan, can you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, uh, we are so on the infancy for reducing opioids. First, we need education, and then we need a way to track morphine milligram equivalents. We don't even know how many opioids we're giving a patient at three key time points in the operating room, during the post-operative time frame, and upon discharge. And you need an MME total, because just saying I got that one got a couple oxy, that one got a couple dilaudid, that one got a couple tramadol, they're all different MMEs. They're not the same. You need a total number. So all you need data, you need education. And then you need alternatives. You need to actually teach people what these alternatives are. Is there a role for regional blocks? Is there a role for, uh, how, are you maximizing Tylenol? Are you giving any other things such as gabapentin? Does gabapentin even work? We have a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, you know, I'm sure this is an international society. A lot of people from listening around the world. Monty, I know in the UK, it, the opioid story there is just slightly different. How does that, you know, translate to you guys? It's, we were starting from a slightly different place. We were already pretty multimodal. And, you know, I've worked both sides of the big pond. So we were much more opiate light by default compared to my experience when I went to work in the US some 20 years ago. Uh, but but it's, it's still an issue that needs addressing. It's still part of the whole equation. So can you do better multimodal? Uh, you know, that's the right thing. And Dan's absolutely right. You've got to know your scorecard. You've got to have an accurate, you know, morphine handicap card. Or you, you don't know where you are. For sure. Well, um, you know, we always talk about what ERAS means to us right now, but we always have to be thinking ahead, especially when we're building programs out and or starting programs and starting to build them out. We have to think about sustainability and what ERAS might look like in the future. Rakesh, from your perspective, what are you thinking? What's ERAS 2.0 for cardiac? So I think there, there are probably two phases of this. One is further developing what we have already decided were priorities for ERAS and building upon data and developing better science around those areas that have lower levels of recommendation because of the level of evidence. So we need more data, we need better studies and focus on the cardiac surgery patient one. Two, there are probably new areas we need to move into and that's what ERAS 2.0 is gonna look like. There are a number of new areas we're looking at going forward. But in part of that will be widespread implementation and helping teams implement and developing processes of centers of excellence. So you can be determined as a group that does this very well uh, and providing information of how you can implement in your team, whatever that team looks like, and then tracking how you're doing month to month, year to year to know you're seeing improvements, because all this is great, but if you're not showing improvements in patient outcomes and hospital outcomes, uh, it, it'll be hard to get much more traction than where we are now without showing benefit. Yeah, no doubt. You know, it, it, I actually hearing you all talk makes me wonder, you know, just like, you know, you need to be ACLS or ATLS certified before you kind of walk into a practice. Why aren't we ERAS certified as cardiac surgeons? You know, this could be something that we could take on potentially as an ERAS cardiac surgery society. And with that, let me pass you over, let me pass it over to Dan. Dan, as we start to wind up this this particular podcast, tell us more about the ERAS, uh, ERAS cardiac society and the collaborative and, and how it is that you know you kind of see that becoming sort of the the, the center point for this movement going forward. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the center point. It's just we have uh, a group of very interested, engaged individuals that uh, contribute. They publish a lot and they uh, just want to be part of the group that's going to move the ball forward. Um, and it's a group made up of half anesthesiologists, half surgeons, a lot of perioperative specialists uh, and people who take care of these patients on a day to day basis. Uh, and, and the short answer is a lot of what Rakesh said. We need to. Uh, collect the same data and then compare it across hospital systems and benchmark. And once we have benchmarks, we can start moving the ball forward by sharing best practice. We need the coordinator from one hospital to call the coordinator from another hospital on a monthly basis, share data. How did you do it? What were your regimens? What were your care sets? And we can constantly be improving everybody across the field. Absolutely. Look, um, I would like to thank everyone on this on this podcast uh, for your time and for your wisdom. And I think this was great. And it was a lot of fun. And, and um, you know, on behalf of the CCS, I would like to thank our sponsors, Edward Life Sciences and our production team. Uh, but, you know, if you want to know more about the CSCS, well, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, CSCS underscore SCC. And on YouTube, uh, we've got a channel actually under CSCS Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons. And uh, 
I would like to thank uh, Desiree Chapel and the Top Med Talk team. I mean, this was a lot of fun. Loved working with you. <laughs> yeah, it was great answer. Whenever I heard that you're a stand-up comedian, I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> 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 I was like, I, I'm not there. But uh, no, I really do appreciate you guys so much uh, for including this including us on this, t on this podcast, I'm just, it's going to be wonderful to share the love. That's what we're all about here on top med talk, right? We want to spread the word in any way that we can. Um, finding you guys on Twitter. You can find us top med talk on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn as well. I'm very excited for this to go out on video on your YouTube channel. Hopefully we can get that uh, mm. pretty, pretty soon too. So that'll be great uh, for your viewers. And um, again, anytime, you know, you guys want to include us, we're always willing to uh, party with you all and, and uh, participate. So good luck to you guys. And uh, we will be talking to you soon. Thanks everyone. Top med talk. Thank you.